So this is going to need a little participation. I got three stories to, to talk about sort of the lens through which I view uh, education today and, and, and education tomorrow. So the first one is one of the oldest math problems we know. So 2 plus 2 is, all right, 2 plus 2 is? Great. Why? So my son, who is five, or five and a quarter, as he likes to tell me every day, and my other son, who is three, or three and a half, as he'd like to tell me every day, they can also tell me that two plus two is four, and I now know why, because I have told them that two plus two is four. And in reality, we all believe that two plus two is four, unless you have an advanced degree in math, because someone told us that two plus two is four. And they were told by someone else that two plus two is four. And so we collectively believe that if you take this representation, combine it with this representation, you put them together, we will universally call that four without ever understanding why. And the current state of public education in America can be explained in just the same way. We are doing things today because we were told to do it this way by someone else who was told to do it this way, by someone else who was told to do it this way, and quite honestly, we basically can't even answer the question why we're doing many of the most basic things we do. And so 2 plus 2 really could be 5, or 2 plus 2 could be 6. So for the remainder of the talk, 2 plus 2 will be 5. So if I say 2 plus 2, you're going to say? Five. If I say 2 plus 2, you're going to say? Five. And we don't know why, but we're going to say it anyhow. And so what do I mean by that? For example, why do we have three months off in the summer? One of the most well-known things now, it has its roots in sort of our agrarian history so that kids can go off and tend to the farm. So I've been teaching for 22 years. This is Kip's 20th anniversary. In all these years, we have 50,000 kids in our school today. And guess out of these 50,000 kids in 20 states in the District of Columbia, in rural areas and urban areas, guess how many children farm? Zero. We have zero farmers in our school. Let's keep going. Why does school go from 9 to 3 or 8.30 to 2.30? Its roots are also in our agrarian history so that kids can tend to the farm in the morning and then they can be home in the afternoon to do the same. And again, out of our 50,000 students, how many of them are farming? Zero. Why are we doing things this way? Why do we have 45-minute classes, or 50-minute classes, or 90-minute classes? Thankfully, this has nothing to do in our history in farming, and I have no idea why we do it. I went on Google, I did the same thing. I'm like, how did this happen? No idea how it happened. Why do we have classes of 25, or classes of 30, or classes of 15? Again, no idea why or how we got here. Now, there's tons of research around class size. And like any good research, you can find some that says it matters and plenty that says it doesn't matter. But none can explain why. And so when we think about the future, people can talk about all types of changes. I want to leave you with one. And it's rooted in our new mathematical equation. 2 plus 2 is? Five. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So here's my hope for the future of school that every kid in every school, every day, gets five minutes of structured academic feedback from their teacher who knows the subject that they're getting feedback on. Seriously, now you may say, this is like the big idea, five minutes of feedback every single day, yes. Five minutes of structured academic feedback. What are they doing well and where do they need to grow? Academic feedback from their teacher every single day. In a totally unscientific survey, I emailed 50 of the best teachers I know across the country from KIPP schools and non-KIPP schools. And I asked them this question, how much structured feedback, academic feedback, do you give every single class every single kid in your class every day. And not one of these 50 award-winning top teachers could actually commit to the fact that every day, every kid gets five minutes 
of feedback. Some days they got it, some days they didn't, and some days they're like, ooh, that's an interesting question. I'm going to need to figure it out. But if you start with that preposition that every kid needs five minutes of feedback every single day, a whole bunch of things need to change. Gone are the assumptions that there is actually a right number of students in class. Because what matters is not the size of the class, but what matters is the structure that allows kids to get the academic feedback that they need. Why is everyone talking about technology? Why, is so, why are we all so obsessed with what is going to be the role of technology in schools? At heart of it is can we get kids structured, individualized, academic feedback? And guess what? Structured, individualized, academic feedback will always be best from a teacher. The promise of technology is it allows these things to happen more readily. So my big idea is simply that 2 plus 2 should be and that every single kid should get five minutes of structured academic feedback every single day. If we started with that, everything in schooling would change. Oh, by the way, I mean during the school day. I don't mean after school. I don't mean on weekends. I don't mean shoehorned into a time where no kid actually wants to learn at like 5.45 in the evening. I mean during the school day, that our schools are wrapped around the needs of the individual kid that sits in front of us. So my first idea is that two plus two is? And that kids need five minutes of structured academic feedback. Now, my second idea has to do with the power of the almighty powdered donut. So, from math to unnutritious snacks. So I was a math teacher for a large part of my career. And I used to run Saturday remedial math classes. And we would run Saturday school, and all the kids would get to choose from these various activities. So some kids got to do orchestra, other kids got to do music, dance, sports. And the kids who struggled during the week, they got to come to me for remedial help with math. So while all their friends went off and did all this fun stuff, the kids would come to me to do math. It was fun. We had a good time. I kept telling myself, this is going to be fun. And what we did is we kept looking for ways to make it fun. And somehow we stumbled on the idea of racing for donuts. And I would stop at the local fine fair supermarket, and I would buy a box of the three color donuts. You all remember these three color donuts? So they had the powder donut, they had the chocolate donut. You with me? All right. Powder donut, chocolate donut, and tan plain thing. Right? That has a name. The tan plain donut. Old fashioned. All right. So here's how the game worked. Right? I had about. 14, 15 fifth graders who needed the extra help, they would come in and we'd have the box of powdered donuts and they would do all their math problems and the kids who finished first and were able to explain their work and were able to make progress, they got to choose the donuts first. Now put yourself in the mind of a nine-year-old. Chocolate powdered old-fashioned, you finished first, you had them all right, what are you choosing? Chocolate. Chocolate. Now you remember these boxes came in nine, so we had nine donuts, 14 kids, a little competition. The second kid chose what? Chocolate. Remember, there are three chocolate, right? Nine-year-olds, right? So the first kid chooses chocolate. The six, yeah, we're off of two plus two is five. We'll, we'll get back with the individual academic feedback here. All right. So, so the first kid chooses chocolate. The second kid chooses chocolate. The third kid chooses? The fourth kid chooses? The fifth kid chooses? The sixth kid chooses? The seventh kid chooses? Nothing. Because there is no nine-year-old who wants to eat an old-fashioned unless they are seriously, seriously hungry. If they have any other option, that donut is being left for the teachers. And quite frankly, the teacher's like, I don't want it either. So, <laughs> so here's how it worked. There was a young girl uh, who, who, who was in my class. Her name, we're going we're to call her Katie for tonight. And Katie, I love teaching kids like Katie. Uh, they present a unique challenge. They always raise their hand. So like this enthusiasm was like contagious. They always raised their hand and very rarely had the right answer. <laughs> and so as a teacher, you're like conditioned. The hand goes up and in your head you're thinking what? Man, how am I going to say no, that's not the right answer in a kind way again? And she hand would go up and she'd say something like, that's not really it. Let me get you some help. I'm going to come back to you. It's going to be okay. Right? And you go through all this stuff. 
And there were lots of tears in Katie's educational experience. And on Saturday, she would come every single Saturday. She would race for the donuts. She never won. And there were lots of tears in Katie's educational experience. And then one day in March of that year, Katie, she didn't win. She didn't come in first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, but she came in sixth. And she earned herself this powdered donut. And she ate this powdered donut with a zest and a zeal and a pride that I have never seen since before ever. The powder was everywhere, her hair all over her face. And there was something there. And in that moment, this was 1997, 98, in that moment, I realized that there were a set of skills, of strengths, that mattered as much as the academic skills and strengths that we were focusing on. So if two plus two is, and kids need structured academic feedback, kids also need to learn the skills that Emily embodied in that pursuit of the powdered donut. She got over her frustrations. She was able to work with focus. She kept believing that effort would pay off in her future. Things like growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about, the sense of optimism that Marty Seligman talks about, the grit, the determination that Angela Duckworth talks about in her research. And what happened to Emily as she grew up? Well, she went off to a high school. This was before Kip has high schools. She went off not to a top high school, to a very good high school. And this isn't like a Hollywood movie. There's no Michelle Pfeiffer. There's nothing happening here, right? She didn't graduate number one in her high school. She did very well. And guess what she went? She went off to a very good public university, which she graduated with very minimal debt, by the way. She didn't graduate number one in her class. She didn't graduate in the top 10% of her class. But she did very, very well in college. And Emily grew up now to be a teacher. And so Katie is running. I mixed up her name. So when I do this, I said Emily. I say Katie because I don't want to use her real name. Uh, so Katie is running these classes on Saturdays as she's doing her own tutoring. But in a little twist, she's using bananas, apples, and grapes <laughs> instead of the powdered donut. But my second hope is that these character skills take their place alongside the academic skills and that we realize that they are the yin and yang of a truly whole education. And you cannot do that without both. So the first story is two plus two is? and the importance of academic feedback. Five minutes every day for every kid. The second story is the powdered donut, and that means that character skills that Katie embodied matter as much as the academic skills. Which brings me to my final and brief story. And as a teacher, you need homework. And your homework involves the shower, the next time you shower. But before we do, let's just sing a little song together. So we're primed to sing, right? M I C. That is the power of muscle memory. And so why is it so hard to change public schools? Why is it so hard to get kids five minutes of academic feedback every day among the other things we'd like to change in public school? Why is it so hard for character skills to be as important as academic skills? It's the next time you shower. It's your homework. So sometime in the next 24 hours, I'm hopeful that most of you will shower. <laughs> so let's start here. Most rooms break up fairly evenly. New York's a slight difference, because New York City, you'll see. Nighttime showers versus morning showers. How many of you are nighttime showers? How many of you are morning showers? All right, so a little more predominance. Usually in New York, by the way, it's nighttime showers. You're on the subway. It's like, anyhow, we'll leave it at that. So <laughs> now we break down into two more ways. Some of you start washing above the neck first. Some of you start washing below the neck. So I call those people the body washers. <laughs> if you are a body washer first, raise your hand. If you are a neck and above washer, raise your hand. So a much more even split here. So here's your homework assignment. And here is how we solve public education in America. We change the way we shower. So the next time you take a shower, just switch. If you're a body washer, become a head washer. If you're a head washer, become a body washer. And since we're not going to see each other again, we're going to have to spoil the reveal. What's going to happen? It's going to be hard. You're going to be confused. 
And you'll start thinking, did I wash this part? Did I not wash this part? Am I clean here? Am I not clean here? And most of you will start all over again, just for the comfort of doing what you're used to. And so here's the thing. We parent the way we were parented. We teach the way we were taught, unless we consciously go about changing our muscle memory. And changing muscle memory is not for the faint of heart, nor are changing the big societal issues we have, such as public education. It will require us changing the way we shower. It will require us changing the structures that we have become habituated to over hundreds of years. But we can do it. We've seen it done. We have enough examples to know that you can build great public schools in every single neighborhood in this country. We have enough examples today to know that demographics should not determine destiny, that your zip code should not determine the type of school that you go to, that we can fundamentally change the muscle memory of our society. So the next time you take a shower, change the way you shower, and please, Think about changing the world. Thank you.